Um, for those of you who may be visiting, I will uh, kind of explain something, and, and I might say apologize a little bit or whatever. You are plopping in the middle of a pretty intense series of lessons. So uh, I, if you are just here, you know, one time for the first time, I know it's not going to make much sense to you, so I, I apologize for, for that. Uh, but if it uh, catches your interest, it, you know, you'll see pretty quickly what we're talking about. Uh, and if it catches your interest, uh, I would be very happy to let you know how either on video or I'll give you every one of my notes, slides, etc. Uh, so that you can look at some of the material before and after your visit today. Um, and that, that offer is good for anybody. I would love for you to be able, we're moving so fast and skipping over a lot of stuff, I'd love for you to be able to look at it. Uh, at your leisure if it, if it interests you to that extent to look at it. What we are talking about is does it make sense from an intellectual logical standpoint to believe that there may be a creator, uh, a superior entity who designed and created what we see. And so uh, that, that's what we're looking at. And we're in the, kind of the final part of that looking at evolution. And does it make scientific sense to believe in evolution or uh, do some of the alternative explanations perhaps uh, make sense? Um, so that's where we are. Also, um, a, a very good friend of mine, highly esteemed brother and all, one of my favorite conversation partners, uh, Daniel, is uh, not with us today. <laughs> Evidently, his little girl has given him the flu or some similar uh, infection. Uh, Daniel, if you happen to be hearing this on YouTube, etc., cetera, uh, we wish you a speedy recovery and hope that you will be back with us very, very soon. Um, so at any rate, uh, just to, to, to pick right back up with where we were, we're, we're looking at the evidence uh, that, that might support evolution, okay? Because I think no matter who you are, no matter what you're inclined to believe or what you've believed up to now, you have got to give every possible explanation a fair shake. If you're really looking for the truth, so if, so if you are a believer in God, you have to at least consider, I mean, and give serious fair consideration to theories of how things may have happened without a God. All right? Uh, and I will say again, if you don't, you're not really looking for the truth. If you're not willing to consider all possibilities, that goes both ways. So if you are inclined to believe in evolution or uh, more broadly that things may have appeared here without a creator, well, you need to consider the possibility that there might be a creator. So everything goes both ways. Well, where we were last week uh, is looking at the evidence for evolution, and we looked at the idea that Darwin himself said, if evolution is true, if the theory is correct, then there have to be millions upon millions of just very slightly changed organisms coming up to more complex organisms, either plant or animal, etc. So we should see all of those. And so Darwin said, and this is around 1860, he goes, you know, we're not seeing that in the fossil record because there should be all these millions upon millions of, uh, you know, there should be a <coughs> continuum of change. He goes, we don't see that in the fossil record. And, and he said, you know, I, I have to admit that. He goes, I, I, I feel sure that the reason for that is we just haven't found those fossils yet. Uh, you know, or certain things just didn't get fossilized somehow. Uh, he says, but we do need to find those. He was confident that, that with enough digging, uh, you know, in enough parts of the world over time that we would eventually find those necessary forms. And he said, if you don't uh, accept my explanation, the, the, the idea that the, the fossil record just has gaps in it and we just hadn't found them yet. He says, if you don't accept that explanation, then yeah, you would rightly reject my entire theory. Okay, that was what Darwin said. Well, as there has now been another 160 years of digging and other work to try to find these things, well, they're still missing. All of these, uh, you know, millions upon millions of intermediate forms are still missing. We haven't found them. Um, in fact, we haven't found any of them that can, that can definitely be labeled as, yeah, this is clearly an intermediate transitional form. We looked at some evidence for that last week, including some of the very good uh, dedicated researchers who do not believe in God, who would love to find such fossils, but nobody has found them. So that's where we are now. But now, if you look in your textbooks, you'll just see, oh yeah, the fossil record, yeah, it supports evolution. So when I'm starting to see these things as I'm researching all this, I'm thinking, okay, wow, they must have found something amazing. 
I, I must have missed something here. You know, we, we must have found some of this very necessary, but, but evidence that's been missing up to now. So I, I eagerly start looking, okay, I, I want to see it, okay? So was there something found? You know, since uh, we looked at Professor Gould's assessment that, you know, uh, it, it's too bad that we're still clinging to the details of Darwin because they're not working out, even though he was a staunch atheist and evolutionist, okay? Uh, so, uh, you know, was there something that, that was unearthed since then th that, that would show us these? I mean, could, could, I don't have to see millions of them. If you can show me, you know, I don't know, a dozen good, clear examples or five, I almost feel like, you know, Abraham bargaining over, uh, over Sodom. Uh, maybe, maybe one or two, uh, then, uh, I, then I can have, a, a, you know, a, an easier time thinking this, uh, this theory is correct. So has there been something discovered? No, not at all. No, there's nothing new, no new discovery. Instead, what I noticed over papers that have been published in the last 15 or 20 years or so, people are start, evolutionists, are starting to just kind of say, yeah, okay, let's just move on from that, okay? Yeah, uh, we, yeah we, we haven't found, we know it's there, we haven't found it, but we know this theory's true, so let's just quit concentrating on this and let's just move on because we all know evolution is true. And so that's what's going on. And I'm thinking, well, are you kidding? I, I, you know, that, that, that can't be your argument, but that's what, what you're seeing in, in a lot of this, um, that we're just, and sometimes it's just stated outright. You know, we all know it's true. There's no point denying it, so we don't need to find these transitional forms. Let's just move on. Okay, uh, and so I'll tell you, and if you, uh, if you want to uh, get these uh, slides or notes from me, uh, there are some, uh, there are a ton of, of, of good uh, references. Here's one that kind of puts a lot of it together. Does the fossil uh, record support creation and the flood, or does it support an evolutionary timeline instead? Uh, and by a, a PhD, Dr. Jeff Miller, uh, and, and it's, it's one of the better summaries I've seen that will point you to a lot of good references you can look at on all sides. And I always encourage you to read all sides of an issue. Don't just, don't just read one viewpoint. Okay, whatever it is, uh, look for everything that's out there. So, here's the thing: the glaring, you know, lack of evidence in the fossil record is a huge discrepancy, and it's a fatal flaw in the evolutionary theory. Now, that may be a term that a lawyer might use in an argument. A fatal flaw means you can't get past this. If you're trying to make this case, you know, you cannot get past this problem in in the argument. Uh, and and I think that this is a fatal flaw. Uh, because, as Darwin noted, you know, if you don't find all of these interminable, he, I mean, it just he, without end, you should be finding transitional forms connecting together all of the extinct and existing forms of life by the finest graduated steps. Because, see, if his theory is correct, that's how it has to be. It, it has to be that way. Uh, he says, if you don't find this, then, yeah, there's a problem with my theory. All right? Um, but that's not the only problem with this theory. We're also on the, that's the fossil side of things. On the biological side, we're missing examples, clear examples of all of these beneficial mutations that have to happen, millions upon billions of them, one after another, to, to get these great new features and changes, you know, and gradual increase in complexity in organisms. We need to see example. We ought to see, I mean, if these are happening all over the place, we ought to be able to have tons and tons of just, you know, clear examples of beneficial mutations producing useful new changes. All right? Uh, now, I'm, if, for the sake of time, I'm not going to uh, illustrate it for you, but let me just tell you this. You know the idea of what a genetic mutation is. But think of it as if you were putting let letters together in a sentence instead of, you know, amino acids together in proteins, et cetera, and nucleotide bases in DNA. All right, if you type out a long sentence, all right, and then you just go in and you just randomly pick a letter and just change it and stick a different random letter in its place, what do you think the chances are that your message, your sentence, is going to be improved or made into something different but useful. Not very good, right? Okay, but you'll still be able to figure out what it is. You've seen enough uh, badly auto-corrected text messages, etc., or, you know, finger hit the wrong uh, letter. You know, you're used to that. You can still, you got enough context. 
but do that a second time and a third time and a fourth and a fifth and a, you know until you've you've replaced an awful lot of the letters in that sentence what are the chances that it's still going to be a useful meaningful piece of information not very good and you can illustrate that if you're any of you are into computer science uh, do good things happen when when one line of code gets corrupted in a computer program no very bad things happen um, all right, so I, I won't uh, I won't show you an illustration of that, but you know that. Okay, so but but here's the evolutionary theory, though, is that yeah, most mutations are bad. Many of them are fatal to the organism, or they do something really bad to the organism. You know, most most mutations are not beneficial, but there could occasionally be one that is. Okay, and if there is. Okay, and that one then uh, leads to another good one, etc. And a useful new feature or function, it makes you more, you know, it makes you stronger or something. Well, then, then that trait would be likely to survive in the population, and then you could have another one. And if you have enough billions of years, then you could have enough of these, you know, to come up with all kinds of things. So, in fairness, I mean, that's that's the theory. All right. Okay, theoretically, yeah, that could happen. So, does it? That's our question. Does it happen? Not just could it happen. Do we see the evidence for that? Uh, but as we said a while ago, if this theory is correct, we should have just, you know, all kinds of examples, clear examples of beneficial mutations. But here are the two examples that we are, are given. Two examples. Sickle cell anemia trait and bacteria that are able to uh, ingest or, or metabolize, digest nylon, you know, a, a man-made compound. Those are the two examples that, that are presented as the examples of beneficial mutations. Well, okay, you know, I would have hoped to see a, a whole bunch, but, but all right, let's look at two of them. Now, we will specifically address some other things later on about changing colors in moths, and animals, uh, antibiotic resistance in bacteria, uh, the size and shape of, of the uh, finch beaks, which is what got Darwin started in the Galapagos Islands, uh, you know, the, the whole thing. Fascinating study, very fascinating. Uh, we'll, we'll look at some of those things later. Well, let's look at these two. Here's sickle cell anemia trait. Now, I've never personally taken care of somebody in the ER with a, a sickle cell anemia crisis. Some of you may have, I don't know. I've seen footage of it. I, I've seen, I've seen uh, you know, film recordings of somebody in a sickle cell crisis. It is not pretty. It is very, very, very ugly. Uh, if you wanna see somebody gasping for breath and in agony every square inch of their body, in a sickle cell crisis. Okay, but sickle cell trait is just not two bad genes for hemoglobin. It's one good one and one bad one. So the idea, and, and now this is true, that if you have sickle cell trait, but not the, the disease, you are slightly more resistant to certain strains of malaria, okay? Uh, because some of the malaria uh, organisms can't, can't deal with that, that uh, altered hemoglobin. So that's the idea, like, well, okay, there's a mutation that, that, you know, it's harmful in some ways, but it confers this useful thing. Here's the problem. It doesn't produce a useful new feature or function, okay? If you have a one bad copy of, of that hemoglobin, if you, if you have the sickle cell trait, it doesn't confer on you an increased ability for something. It is that you might be more resistant, slightly more resistant to a disease process. Do you see the difference? It, it doesn't allow you to see a different color or to have a, a, an extra digit, uh, you know, or, I mean, and I'm not trying to be facetious here. It, it doesn't give rise to a new function or, or feature. Uh, it is definitely not considered an advantage by people who have it, I can tell you that. Because even if you just have sickle cell trait and not the full-blown disease, uh, you will not do well on a long hike or at any kind of altitude or any athletic event or anything that requires good oxygen transport. Okay? It will affect your life and not in a, in a fun way. 
So uh, ask anybody who's got sickle cell anemia trait, it's fairly rare. Uh, and they will, they will tell you no. Uh, I don't feel like I, I've you know, I, I'm got an advantage on everybody else. Um, and it is not a survival advantage. That's important because it doesn't fit with the evolutionary theory. It does not give you an overall survival advantage because malaria is not very prominent, et cetera, and it is not increasing in the population. If you've ever studied genetics, there's a particular thing, Hardy-Weinberg law, okay? Uh, if something is beneficial, it will, or you would expect that it would be increasing in the population. Sickle cell trait is not. That tells you it is not advantageous overall. Does that make sense? Uh, not a great example of a beneficial mutation. All right, well, how about nylon eating bacteria? Um, and I, I actually, I do want to uh, thank a, a good friend of mine for bringing this to my attention the first time a couple of years ago uh, and, and leading me to delve into it and actually uh, get some details on it. All right, um, there, was, there have been some bacteria discovered that are able to, to uh, ingest and digest uh, nylon, uh, whereas most bacteria ca cannot. They, they just don't know what to do with, with nylon. It, it would be like, you know, uh, you eating styrofoam, you're not going to do that because it's not going to go well. Okay, uh, so, but there are some that can do it. Well, here are the problems with this as being an example. Now, I give it, I give it you know, credit for, uh, for a possibility. I spent a lot of time looking into it. Nobody can agree exactly what the mutation is in this bacteria. Some people think it's a point mutation, it's a frame shift mutation, for those of you who kind of know what those things are. Nobody can identify, yep, here's the mutation here. Here it is. Nobody can even agree exactly what it is. It is not rock solid sure that it's actually a mutation instead of something that just this strain of bacteria has existed for thousands of years, et cetera. We don't know because you can't, they can't figure it out. And that brings me to the next point. There's no way to know that this actually occurred after the invention of nylon. Now, that's okay. If it were a, 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 an evolutionary mutation, it still, it, the mutation could have occurred before nylon. Okay, that would be fine. But you can't say that, yeah, you know, the introduction of nylon spurred this, this mutation to occur. That, that's not for sure. Uh, but by random event, what I'm saying is this bacteria may have had that ability for the last 5,000 years. And we just never knew it until somebody invented nylon. You, you see what I mean? So it's, it's not a, that, doesn't, that doesn't rule it out, but it, it's not a, you know, a clear example. Uh, in this bacteria, there is a corresponding loss of some other important functions. So it has given up something uh, uh, with this. It's not as good as other bacteria. Now that's, you know, that's okay. Uh, that, that doesn't rule it out either. The metabolism is extremely inefficient of nylon. It doesn't ingest it very, digest it very well. Again, hey, that, that's, that does not rule it out. But here's the bottom line. It does not give this, this bacteria a survival advantage. It doesn't give it a, uh, it does, you, you might say, gives it a useful function if the world were, were full of nylon, but it's not increasing in the bacterial population, which you would expect if it were a good example of evolution. So here's the thing, the two examples that we have of supposedly beneficial mutations, those are the two that the theory is depending on, and they're not great examples. That's the, the, the thing with this. All right. So I, I'm kind of saying, I mean, is that the evidence that I'm supposed to accept this, this theory on? These are the two examples we have of beneficial mutations. Okay, that's a whole lot of it could happen. Um, all right, but here's the bottom line with this. I want you to note this. There are no examples given of accumulating change. That is a new trait or a new feature or function that is multiply that it is becoming more prominent and therefore might spread to other you know new species etc there is no accumulating change we see people with sickle cell trait but it's not turning into anything else we see bacteria that can weakly digest nylon but it's not turning into anything else now you might say well yeah of course because you know we only have our lifetime okay valid point valid point but we don't see any evidence of accumulating change or increased complexity. We don't have any examples of, of that that can be clearly identified. All right, so in summary, 
none of the phenomena that the, that the theory depends upon have ever been observed or documented or are clearly known to occur. It's still just, it could happen. That, that's what you've got with this theory. So at some point I would say, you know, are we going to take Mr. Darwin's advice and say, yeah, there's a problem with this theory. Uh, he knew that there might be, but he thought over time that the gaps would be filled in. They have not been. They have become more uh, distinct and, and uh, more conspicuous. Okay, but you might say, hey, but look, improbable things can happen. <clears throat> yes, that's true. You've probably heard this, right? We all know that if a million monkeys, you know, with a million typewriters typed, you know, at random for a million years, I mean, one of them, by chance, would, would turn out the works of Shakespeare, right? You've heard that, okay? Well, here's the thing. That was a real good idea until somebody did the math on it. Uh, and I've checked it and checked it and double-checked it and, 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 you know, it's, and from all critical sides, etc. To turn out the works of Shakespeare by monkeys typing at random would take 23 trillion years. The estimated age of the universe is 13.8 billion years. And this is, you know, by, by the longest estimate, okay? Um, the estimated age of, of the Earth uh, among most scientists is about 4.8 to 5 billion years. The estimated time that evolutionists will tell you that life has existed on Earth is about 3.8 billion years. You may or may not accept that, but I'm just telling you, you know, that those are the longest estimates. We're talking about 23 trillion years, but there's a catch. That's not a million monkeys. That's if every proton in the entire universe was a monkey with a typewriter. How many would that be? Right, that would be that many monkeys. Okay, typing continuously at a rate of 400 words a minute, 24 hours a day for more than 23 trillion years. Then in that case, yes, one of them would eventually turn out the collected works of Shakespeare. Now, okay, you can criticize the math on that and say, well, okay, but yeah, but one, one of them could turn out one piece, and then if it got connected with another little snippet that another one did, so you could get it in a shorter time. I understand very well the mathematical arguments both ways. But I will tell you this, in a million years with a million monkeys, what you get is just a little less than half of a text message of Shakespeare's collected works. Here's my point. You can argue numbers back and forth, it doesn't look good mathematically. It doesn't look good at all mathematically, all right? So the biology and the math we've looked at, uh, they kind of tell you, yeah, I'm not sure this can happen. Even in the best of circumstances, uh, th this, I don't, uh, this is questionable, highly questionable. But the missing evidence tells you, evidently it didn't happen. Evidently, that is by the evidence, it didn't happen. Okay? I'd be willing to overcome all of the improbability of it if you could show me that, yeah, well, but it happened. If you could show me the evidence of it happening, but the evidence is missing. So you're saying on one hand, yeah, against all odds it could happen, and we don't have the evidence, but it happened anyway. The evidence just didn't get captured. It's just not adding up very well. So what Stephen Jay Gould did is put this together uh, in another idea, he recognized this problem. You saw my quote from him last week about the missing evidence, uh, the missing fossil evidence. And he's an evolutionist. He's an atheist. Okay? I'm not putting any words in his mouth. I showed you his entire quote about the problems with that. So he honestly recognized that, yeah, we're missing all of these transitional forms. We just don't have them. Okay? That's inference. Uh, to, to put together these phylogenetic trees of, yeah, it, you know, here's dead matter and here's the first protein or RNA and you've got something alive and, okay, and, you know, you've got primates and humans and, you know, you've got earthworms over, over here and, uh, you know, you've got these trees, branching trees. You no longer see the progression of, you know, apes uh, to upright. Uh, they've taken that out of the textbooks now because it's finally, that was complete fabrication. So you don't quite see that anymore unless you look, you know, a few years back. But you do see this all the time, that, yeah, well, this, is, this is how the, the thing evolved. Well, what Dr. Gould pointed out was that, that we're missing this. Here's a, a, just a short snip of that quote I gave you last week. The extreme rarity of transitional forms in the fossil record. And you've heard somebody else say, I don't even know of one. I don't even know of one. Okay. 
uh, persists as the trade secret of paleontology. He's telling you, we all know th the, the evidence is missing. Okay, we all know that. We don't talk about it much, but we know it. All right. The evolutionary trees that adorn our textbooks have data only at the tips and the nodes of their branches. The rest is inference. He says, no, I think it's reasonable. He's an evolutionist. He says, I think it's reasonable, but it's not in the evidence. So what he's telling you is, here's what we really know to be true of that tree. Yes, there are bony fish. And yes, there are amphibians. And yes, there are bats and who and okay. Here's, he's telling you, here's what we actually know. Everything else in between is kind of our best inference. Okay, that's the reality of the situation. So here's what he says. This is from, from his observations. The consistently observed pattern is this, the, in, in the fossil record. The abrupt appearance of a variety of life in its very fully formed, final, complex form. They just appear out of nowhere in the fossil record. And they stay pretty much the same. Okay, people may get a little taller, a little shorter on average, but they stay the same until they disappear, until they're extinct, with no significant changes in between their appearance and their disappearance. Okay, so he said, I'm going to call this uh, evolution by punctuated equilibrium. That is, things stay the same for a long time, and then for some reason there's like a flurry of activity and a bunch of new organisms appear, and they stay the same for a really long period of time. Okay, you see what he's saying? He's observing this is what we see in the record. So his tree looks more like this instead of this very nicely branching thing. It's like all this stuff appears at once. And then as time goes on, maybe you see, you, you know, the wombat looks a little bit different from the kangaroo, etc. That's what he's telling you. In fact, it's more like this because there is no common, there is no common uh, uh, ancestor found between any of them they just all appear suddenly in the fossil record. There's no observed transitional pattern at all. There is no observed connection between any of these at all. Now you can say it could happen, but we don't have the evidence of it. Instead, like I said, what the fossil record shows is the abrupt appearance of all of these fully formed different plant and animal species no real changes. In fact, the fossil record shows then that, that tons of these things were all wiped out in some kind of mass extinction event, which looks like it may have happened by water. And then there's the sudden reappearance of all kinds of stuff. The Cambrian explosion is sometimes called of new life in the next you know, sediment layer up. Things that look like the life you see today, okay? Dr. Gould made a, a good observation of reality, but he didn't have any explanation for why things happened that way, all right? And a lot of people don't really like that thought at all because it kind of looks consistent with the idea of creation by a superior entity, mass extinction, and some kind of a uh, aqueous water event and then the sudden reappearance of all kinds of fully formed life with no real changes since then. Which is a theory I think you've uh, read somewhere else, but you know, we, we can't have that. So the fossil evidence that, that has to exist for the widely held theory of Darwinian or Neo-Darwinian evolution, it's all missing. And what we do find in the, the fossils completely contradicts that theory but would fit perfectly with a creation hypothesis instead. There's another fatal flaw for evolutionary theory, but there are more. Those phylogenetic trees, no matter how they try to refine them, there are gaps and skips in them. There are things that occur in this organism, but then they're missing in the next one that they say is the transitional form. The next one doesn't have color vision, etc., and then the next one does. You can't have that. I mean, you, you can't have the, the flaws. Um, there are, well, I, I'll, I'll spare you this. There are all kinds of examples of that. And if you really want to mess somebody up, ask them, where does the octopus family fit on that uh, tree? I, I didn't see that one anywhere. 
because uh, nobody could figure that out and people are actually starting to go back to the idea of like well maybe it landed here from outer space and that was a like didn't didn't fit with the other evolutionary tree okay a lot of problems with this theory um, but in fairness we do have to look at this there is variation in animals over short periods of time uh, and this is offered as, as proof of the validity of this because here's the idea and here's what Darwin first observed he was on the Galapagos Islands and he noticed he's looking at these finches little birds okay and he noticed that they have different sizes and, and shapes of their beak and it corresponds with what they tend to eat some of them eat little tiny seeds so they have little sharp pointy beaks Others of them eat, you know, tend to eat more like bigger nuts and stuff like that. So they have a different shaped beak that's bigger and, you know, it won't fit into tiny corners, but it's better at cracking, you know, bigger nuts. Okay, so their beaks kind of, you know, match what they eat. All right, good observation. And so they have noticed that, that those things seem to change, especially in, in, a, in a place like the Lapagos Islands where you've got kind of some isolation. Uh, and so they notice these things changing over time, even from one generation to the next. Hey, that's pretty Im impressive. That's pretty amazing. So the idea is, hey, they can evolve even like within 30 or 40 years uh, to, to, to their changing environment. So if you can see, you know, we may not understand it, but if you can see evolution happening that fast right in front of your eyes, well, then it's not hard at all to think that you could get a whole lot more evolution over a few billion years. All right. So I think we need to, to look at that. Um, let's look at what I'm going to call the shifting evidence for evolution. If you can observe definite significant variation in, in sh a short period of time, doesn't that suggest that, hey, look, it, it may surprise us, but evolution is evidently occurring right under our noses at, at a blinding pace, you know, so to speak, relatively. Uh, so, you know, it, can't you extrapolate that to say then, yeah, uh, so it doesn't look so improbable at all. Never mind the odds, it's happening right in front of us. Okay, I would ask that question too. So, you know, here's the, the question. Uh, let me go, go back one if the computer will do that. Uh, the, the two questions, you know, doesn't that suggest that these beneficial mutations are occurring and producing new features? And doesn't that suggest that, that, okay, if you can see this much of it in 30 years, that no problem to have a whole lot of it in a few billion years? Well, I would say that it would have been logically reasonable to answer the first question with yes. That does look like some evolution's happening. And, you know, the second question, then couldn't a whole lot of evolution have happened? I, I, I would have to have said, well, yeah, maybe so. Until we understood what was actually going on with those organisms. And for that, we can thank some really great research uh, by a group of people, largely evolutionists, but read their work. Uh, I, sometimes the, the, I read their evidence and I read their, their analysis of it. I'm thinking that, you know, did you just look at the same evidence that you just showed me that I just looked at? But never mind, look at their evidence. Okay, uh, we'll look at some representative examples here, and I'm gonna uh, mention some of these pretty quickly. There are bacteria that can become resistant to certain antibiotics. Okay, you know that. So that certain antibiotics don't work very well for them anymore. Uh, and they might, but they might not, all right? Pesticide resistance in insects is a kind of very same phenomenon. Antibody production. You hear a lot about this these days in the human body and most other animals too. Uh, when we are presented with pathogens that cause us harm, the body can, if, if, you, if it doesn't kill you right away, your body can figure out after a period of time how to make antibodies that match, kind of like a lock and key almost, to neutralize the, the uh, invading offender. All right? Doesn't that sound like evolution? Because it's, you know, it's evolving a mutation to, to do that. Uh, the peppered moss, the color changing animals, and then those finch beaks. I want us to definitely look at that. Okay. First of all, let's understand natural selection is an absolute fact. I mean, you can demonstrate it, you can do experiments, you can observe it. Natural selection is a fact. Let me just give you an example. If, I mean, if you're faced with some kind of a, a limitation or, or condition, 
the organisms which are already best suited, uh, you know, for that uh, are going to survive better than the ones that are not. Suppose uh, I, the, sl the slowest deer in the herd. Gets eaten. The slowest deer in the herd gets eaten. There you go. Okay, yeah. As they say, if you're attacked by a bear, you don't have to outrun the bear. You just have to outrun your friend. Um, <laughs> pretty cruel. But uh, anyway, <laughs> yeah. Okay, if, uh, if, if, you, if we all had to walk through a, you know, a, a buzz saw that was mounted here and it was set at a five foot height, a lot of us wouldn't do very well with that. Uh, but there are a couple of people who have a definite superior advantage that, yeah, they'd be okay. Okay, the next generation uh, wouldn't look quite as tall as this generation. You get it. It's a definite fact. But here's the thing. You got to have stuff to select between. Okay, to, to have natural selection, you have, to have, you have to have a variety to select from. So as one Dutch botanist observed, he goes, natural selection can explain the survival of the fittest. It just doesn't do anything to explain the arrival, the initial existence of the fittest. Okay, so if phenotypic, that is what we look like, that's what color your eyes are, never mind what genes you're, you're carrying. If the phenotypic variation exists, then natural selection w will operate uh, upon those things if a stress or a limitation is applied. So let's take a, a look at some of those. With antibiotic resistance, pesticide resistance, antibody production, but you know what we now know? Is that all of these organisms have certain areas uh, of their genome that are hypervariable reg regions. They're not mutating overall, but they are constantly shifting through combinations, almost like the swirling wheels on a combination lock. That is, that's what they do. They constantly churn out just new things. They try new things, but over the period of time, they don't change overall. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, and so one bacteria may hit a combination that lets it survive against that antibiotic. And by the way, you know what they do then? They package it in something called a plasmid and share it with the next bacteria over. They say, hey, guess what? Here's the resistance recipe. Try this one. Um, okay, but it doesn't change over time. There's no accumulating change and there's no new function. Uh, I'm gonna skip over some of those and tell you about the beak of the finch, and I know I'm a, a minute or so over, but w I'm going to tell you this, if you'll hang with me a couple of minutes and we'll wrap it up for today. And next week, we will wrap up the whole thing, okay, because they're going to shut me out the door and I do not blame you. Uh, you'll still have good food to eat, you just won't have some of the junk uh, to eat. All right. Here's the thing with these, these finches I told you about, and you see that their beak's changing. Well, here's what was discovered by some really good work. There's a guy named Jonathan Weiner who wrote a whole book about this, and he's an evolutionist, by the way. But what he observed was that, okay, Darwin only had a few years to observe this, and now we've had another 160 years. But you know what? We're still looking at the same collection of beak sizes and shapes that they had 160 years ago. There's still a handful of beak sizes and shapes, and they just rotate among that selection, but they don't change overall. Now, somebody figured out why. Have you ever looked at maybe a photograph of your ancestors and, and discovered that, whoa, your great, great aunt on your mom's side and you're looking at yourself? Okay, have you ever seen something like that? Or, you know, somebody had this particular shape of nose, et cetera, and you didn't see it for a couple of generations and now you've got it and maybe you hate it or maybe you love it, I don't know, whatever. But you know what I'm talking about? There can be things that have been carried but were not expressed. And it turns out that with those finches, they're all carrying the entire library of various beak sizes and shapes. Which one gets expressed in a particular organism and generation is something called epigenetics. That means this generation is gonna grow big curved beaks because that's what the food supply is, but they're still carrying the same genetic information for five other beak sizes and shapes, which to me is quite amazing 
but they're not evolving over time it doesn't change they just Wiener says they just kind of wobble about an average beak without any change they're already carrying all of the possibilities that just blows my mind because that was the big example that was supposed to make evolution possible over the long term the finches aren't evolving they're not changing at all over time, but they have an amazing capacity for short-term change because they're already carrying the full deck of cards. And in any generation, they play the one that matches the food supply. Unbelievable. All right, we'll take a look at some more next week. You have been so kind. We will wrap it up. And I hope that some of you uh, uh, may take me up on uh, taking a copy one way or another of the file of slides because you may want to look at some of this later on. Um, and some of it might be more interesting later on depending on who you run into in your life. I don't know. Thanks, folks. I hope you have a great week ahead. I appreciate your being here. Hey, guys, real quick. I mentioned this Wednesday night. I got three uh, thank you cards for you guys to come up and sign. Again, we've had a lot of people helping with making this room look really awesome. So I'm going to leave these on the counter over here for you just to sign over the next couple of weeks, okay? You know, that, that in and of itself uh, makes you have to feel like there's got to be an ultimate design because we would put all that stuff in a little I know. It. To me, yeah, it was supposed to be the evidence. That's why I put it under what I call the shifting evidence. It was supposed to be the evidence slam bang for evolution. But not only is it not, it looks a whole lot like incredible design. Yeah. It's who, like, who would have oh, thought, thought that? Who would have given them all of this amazing range of ability? You know, I was going to ask you about some of this. And, uh...